Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Really excited today to have a fellow New College alum with me. I have Jennifer Granick here. She is the Surveillance and Cybersecurity Council at the American Civil Liberties Union, also known as the ACLU. Jennifer, welcome to Trending in Education. Thank you. Happy to be here having this conversation. Absolutely. And hopefully we'll do a little bit of a two-pronged attack today, ramping our listeners up a bit on what you've been doing throughout your career around cybersecurity and educating people around surveillance and all the work you're doing now with the ACLU. There's plenty to talk about there. As if that weren't enough, our alma mater, New College of Florida, has bumped up to the top of the national zeitgeist around academic freedom and some of the things that are happening there. Hopefully we'll be able to hit on both of those things throughout this conversation. We will be launching a separate feed dedicated to New College where we'll be able to go deep and long on this. As we get started, when we get to know folks for the first time, I always like to begin with your origin story, catch folks up on how you got to this point in your professional life. You've done a lot. Yeah, I'm old now, so (laughs) I have a longer story to tell. So I'm from New Jersey. I think that's really important, a formative experience for me. And then I would say the second most formative experience for me is definitely having gone to New College. You went there, and I know you have other people on this podcast who went there. Mm -hmm. Um, It was truly, you know, something that made me the person that I am today for a lot of reasons. But I think one of them was that ability or that responsibility to, like, really be in charge of your own education, which is this fundamental tenet of the school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't necessarily get out of there with a lot of practical skills, but that's that's not necessarily that, you know, obligation of a liberal arts college level education. So I went to law school, which I did not like at all, but it did give me a license at the end to enable me to practice law. Mm -hmm. And I did criminal defense for about 10 years Mm. after that, which I think surprised literally no one in my life. It was probably exactly what my parents would have wished and expected. So nothing particularly radical, you know, in any of my career choices. And from there, you know, it was around about the time of the birth of the public Internet. And I sort of fell in love with the Internet. And, you know, it was before the World Wide Web. Just so much about it I thought was amazing. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to study and learn about the law as it connects with this new technology, Mm because I think it's going to be really big. (laughs) Yeah. And it was really big. And I really like got in kind of on the ground floor for lawyers recognizing and policy people recognizing this. So I got recruited to work at Stanford Law School with Professor Larry Lessig building this Center for Internet and Society. And that involved teaching a clinical course, which, you know, is meant to give law students some practical experience. You take Mm -hmm. cases, they work on them, as well as kind of building up the center as a resource for students and as a, you know, policy advocacy organization working with Larry Lessig about, you know, various things having to do with free speech online, privacy, and that sort of thing. And just to jump Um, in real quick to represent for Generation X, which we both are part of, it is interesting when folks talk about digital natives, there's a contrast that I think we can make where we may not be native to it, but we were pioneers. We were folks who were upstream to everything that we're experiencing nowadays. And that's why for you, as someone who got in early, the level of depth that you get to when you stick with an emerging field for this period of time. That's why I was really excited, separate from New College. Yeah. It's exciting to get some of your perspective on how this stuff is evolving. Yeah, I think it really does help in thinking of my work, both about like cybersecurity. I'm not a technologist, obviously, I'm a lawyer, but I have some sense, a real sense of how it works by having watched the internet grow up from what it was back in like the gopher days thinking about free speech also and how important free speech online is because I grew up in a time where if you had something to say, you didn't have an opportunity to say it. Like maybe you could get your mimeographed zine into some radical bookstore in, you know, lower Manhattan. Right. But that was kind of it for you, mm-hmm. you know? So I really have that abiding love for, you know, the internet and for speech on the internet. 
right. then also I think like you talked about digital natives, like my daughters are 15. They've never used a map. Like they just asked Google how to get places. If they right. didn't have, I don't think they would know how to like, you know, even get anywhere. Right. So yeah. they don't understand server client architecture, which is mm -hmm. just this very basic thing about the internet. Like what is in the cloud? It's all accessible on their phone. Right. So they don't have any sense about like, is it here? Is it there? When can right. I access it? They have always on data. You know, there's just a lot of differences when you were born and it was already here versus as you like grew up or evolved with the technology. Absolutely. And would love to get a little more into your role with the ACLU. But this also is a place where the other generations that Gen X bridges is when we testify before Congress, we're frequently educating baby boomers and folks who may be even less familiar with yeah. some of these technologies. That's where the educational component of what you've been doing was certainly interesting. I was just in court the other day, last week, and the judges had lots of questions about the technology. And, you know, judges love to say like, oh, you know, we're not the most, you know, we're not the most technological people. I'm not on Facebook. Like a lot of judges love to say that. And, you know, I think in some cases it's true. But part of what you're doing when you're presenting a policy argument or a legal argument is kind of catching everybody up yep. and helping people understand something beyond like just what's the headline. Yeah. The Ideally, day. there's some truth to what you're communicating. You almost need to simplify the underlying technology so that it's still accessible, but not talk about pneumatic tubes necessarily. You know, like yeah, where do you that's land? Yeah, so simple. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. it is. I mean, that's a thing about teaching that I think is sort of important is like, when do analogies help? And when do analogies kind of take away or yeah. like, mm -hmm. you know, everybody kind of wants to win the battle of analogies, but you know, which one is most resonant. But the truth is for some of the things we're dealing with today, there is no analogy. You know, mm -hmm. there is no past example that really captures everything that's going on mm -hmm. now, kind of having to get to a point where you understand things, not at the analogy level, but like at the real level with enough you know, sort of detail to understand its special characteristic. It's certainly true with technology. I think it's true with politics now, yeah, you know, yeah. politics look a lot different than they have before in, you know, most of our lifetimes. So right. I think it's, yeah, I mean, as a teacher, right, figuring out how to communicate that stuff to somebody who's not an expert or not yet an expert without having it be overly simplified and yeah. you know, lead to a conclusion that may not be accurate, I think is a, is a big challenge. And the storytelling element of it, the narrative element of it, there are certain things that kind of bring a listener in. And then as a lawyer, it's also, you know, what will convince a jury, what will convince a judge. There is a level to which you need to be buttoned up in terms of the actual precedent. But then to your point, you know, the law is continuing to evolve. That's where I'd love yeah. to hear a little more about your current role, which is with the ACLU and also with your expertise in surveillance and cybersecurity. Well, it's a great job and it's a fantastic organization, just a really fantastic organization. And the thing I would say, I'm in the Speech Privacy and Technology Project, but the ACLU has a number of projects that deal with, you know, civil liberties and equality battles all over the place, whether it's LGBTQIA or it is immigrants' rights, women's rights, racial justice, criminal law reform, voting rights. I mean, I could go on. Mm -hmm. And then the ACLU has affiliates in basically every state. And that means that we've got people in each of the states who are there fighting the battles on the ground. Yeah. It's an amazing organization and just amazing to be a part of. What I do there is just like one small part. And I, as I said, work with the Speech Privacy and Technology Project. So most of my work is on the privacy side. And most of that work is about surveillance by the government. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have people who do consumer privacy dealing with how companies collect all our information and then, you know, often sell it to law enforcement. But my area of expertise is about foreign intelligence surveillance. For example, all the revelations that we learned about from Edward Snowden yes. um, and other whistleblowers. And I also do some free speech online work, working with my colleagues who are First Amendment experts. And all of this yeah. is at granite.com. And the book, which I'd want to note here, is American Spies, which. Oh, uh, yeah, my book. Thank you yeah. for mentioning that. Yeah. It's really important. So, talking about New College, the cover of this book 
was done by one of my new college friends, Diane Godzinski Benjamin. Oh, so sure. Now who is married to Josh Benjamin, also mm-hmm. one of our new college friends. Yeah. And the, the website for this book was designed and maintained by Doug Lachlan, also nice. yeah. a new college alum. You know, and it's just so wonderful to have people like that that you went through, you know, the crucible of college with who decades later are there for you and are so creative and supportive and contribute to something. I mean, they were there in the beginning and they're still here for me. And I just think that that's so awesome. Yeah. And I think maybe that's a great time for us to pivot a little more to the new college side of the story where... Because I'm also of Gen X, I like to make pop culture references, and I frequently quote Patrick Swayze's character from Dirty Dancing, nobody puts baby in a corner. It does feel like (laughs) what the DeSantis administration is doing with New College is something that I would imagine a civil rights attorney and someone who's been focusing on privacy and the law throughout your career I'm upset because it's New College, but you're upset and you're also an expert who has some experience in this space. I'd love to hear some of your thinking about what's happening, what folks can do about it, what folks need to be aware of, anything you think makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it it makes it personal that this, you know, academic intolerance movement has made New College the example and, you know, gone after our school. But, you know, we aren't the first and we aren't the only victims Mm. of this. And, you know, there's been a rash of something that we just really haven't seen in recent times, which is book banning Mm -hmm. and, you know, efforts to basically get rid of books like genderqueer and other kinds of related topics under the guise of protecting children. And then, you know, we have the Stop Woke Acts, which are meant to inhibit people from learning about history and the American past and how it affects, you know, our current political and economic situation. You know, racism and slavery are part of our history and it matters to this very day. And they don't want people to say that. But at the ACLU, we've challenged those laws that would punish teachers for what they say in class. So far, you know, those lawsuits are ongoing, these First Amendment free speech challenges. But, you know, the DeSantis team has a full-time PR campaign meant to invigorate the base who, you know, I don't want to characterize people because I'm sure it's very, very, you know, the type of person who's attracted to that. But I think that there's, you know, this feeling out there that somehow America's gone wrong because liberals have taken over Mm -hmm. and America's gone wrong because we're becoming, you know, increasingly accepting of people's different gender identity and sexuality and that that's all bad and they Mm kind of you know felt more comfortable with the stuff they were more used to no small part i think of going after new college part of it is ideological just a perception that the school is you know progressive but part of it is definitely an anti-trans movement based Mm on the perception accurate i think that a high percentage of the students there identify as trans or queer or non-binary And there's been kind of like a dog whistle. We're going to teach the kids the truth. And I think one of those truths is, you know, America, yay, America. (laughs) And I think the other truth is that, you know, being trans is a lie. You know, a non-binary gender identity is a lie. You know, people need to learn the truth about gender, that it's like one or the other. Right. Uh, And, you know, that is, I mean, it's attack on our school. It's an attack on progressivism. It's an attack on academic freedom, but it is a very personal attack on the students who are there now, who I think to a large part have found a safe haven, you know, in a place where they can really focus on their academics without having to pay a bazillion dollars. I know for my family, the fact that New College was affordable, even for out-of-state tuition, was a big factor in my being able to go to such a great college. So, you know, it is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it's been great that we've seen other colleges extend an open hand, a welcoming hand to new college people by inviting transfers. Right. But the financials sometimes, you know, just don't work out. Right. They're matching tuition for the first year, but then after that, you have to apply for financial aid, which may or may not be feasible, you know, for people. Yeah. And it also just feels sad to me that there will be this diaspora of people, you know, who are growing up together the way we were growing up together, you know, the way I grew up with my friends who helped me with the book. And there we are, you know, in the middle of this like very formative time. And then suddenly we're blown apart to different parts of the country. Right. It does remind me a little bit of the March for Our Lives students where it wasn't their choice to be on campus when the shooting happened, but then they suddenly were thrust onto a national stage and they were the spokespeople of anti-gun violence and really representing for the rising generation. There is a little bit of that, I think, happening now. I don't think the cause of academic freedom necessarily resonates as viscerally as gun rights after a mass shooting. But there is a level to which this is rattling cages. Maybe they anticipated a a, a response, but it does feel like certainly among people who are in academia, you know, the way they're attacking tenure, they don't seem to care much about the current accreditation and will perhaps go in a different direction here. It is a more fundamental attack on higher ed as an institution using new college as a patsy really, for lack of a better word. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I can tell you, though, as like a lifelong activist is that it is extremely difficult because we have other responsibilities and other jobs. You know, these students' main job is being students and learning and getting out of college. The faculty are supposed to teach. You know, even for me, where my job is like full-time advocacy, I have free speech online work. I have, you know, foreign intelligence surveillance. I have criminal stuff. There are people whose sole job day and night is to basically beat down academic freedom and attack new college. They have nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. It is their one life mission. And so here you are with people who are, I mean, they're students, you know, they're young people with a lot personally at stake and a lot of things to manage. And they have to band together to fight these crusaders whose this is their life mission and they're not doing anything else. Yeah. It's a little bit in the ACLU context is not exactly the same, but we try to fight for strong encryption to protect people's communications and to enable people to have conversations privately and to protect themselves from abusive government surveillance and identity thieves, all that stuff. There are people in the Department of Justice whose whole career is to fight against the proliferation of strong encryption. Right. And talk to Congress, talk to legislators you know, push companies, you know, all that stuff. It's Mm -hmm. one of our issues. Mm -hmm. It's all of a number of people's issues on the other side. And here, in the new college context, you're seeing an even worse balance of power Mm -hmm. between people who are teaching and learning and people who are in a crusade. Yeah. And it does feel like, you know, a bit of an Independence Day moment where it's a rallying cry for any of us who have some affiliation with New College to kind of band together and provide support to each other, in particular support to current students, their families, faculty, and their families, because those are the the folks who really are on the front lines. Do you have any advice or recommendations in terms of what people can do if they're activated and they want to protect and defend academic freedom and some of the things that we care about about New College? Yeah, I mean, I do. I think one thing, you know, that really has been really heartening is how many people have come forward and said, I care and I want to do something both to protect the legacy of the school and, you know, something that I love, but also to support the students who are there now. And I think that's great The I think issue has been how do you take that groundswell of support and direct it into something you know that's coherent and productive and that's hard with any social movement but maybe particularly hard to round up the cats that are new college alums yes (laughs) yes i don't know i think that's a possibility but the thing i think right now really helps that people need to do is they need to call legislators 
who are considering whether to retain this board of trustees. I think that's really important. People don't like to call because it's really uncomfortable to call strangers and say stuff. But on the New College Twitter thread and on the Facebook page, and then there's a Slack that a number of alums have joined too, there are these efforts to kind of reach out to other decision makers and they listen, you know, especially if you're from Florida, they count and they care because in those seats, very few hundred votes make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So they're actually listening. And I think calling really is helpful. And then I know there's been some funds to support students. You know, giving money is always difficult. People don't have it and you don't necessarily see exactly where it's spent or how it goes. But, you know, right now, I think we're kind of in a crisis mode. So for people who can afford it to give money to support, you know, so students aren't paying out of pocket for posters, right? you know, or if it means that, you know, they can get a bus to bring a whole bunch of Eckerd students to a rally on campus to support. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that kind of stuff is, you know, really kind of ground level yeah. important. Yeah. And I guess also speak our truth, which is part of the idea of talking to more people about New College, people who are stakeholders. It's different, I think, depending on how you've gotten to this point where you've already been activated against causes. But for folks who maybe haven't, you know, this is something that can be an opportunity to lean in and try to make a positive impact. I'd like to switch gears back a little bit more on the, the cyber side and on the security side. Are there trends in education or trends around learning about that technology? Obviously, ChatGPT and generative AI is all the rage nowadays. Can't get through an episode without saying ChatGPT at least once. <laughs> but I'd love to get some of your thoughts on that side of things in terms of emerging technology and privacy. It's a moving target, but if there's anything that's bubbling up, I'd love to hear about it. I mean, you bring up ChatGPT and kind of laugh like, oh, you have to say it. We were talking before about how we kind of grew up with the internet technology. We feel comfortable with it and generally feel like it evolved in a direction that benefited a lot of free speech and a lot of political activism. But the industry is more mature and there are problems now that we're trying to manage. ChatGPT to me is like, boom, like that is not a something we grew up with. That's yeah. a you know, I asked it to write a blog post about the Fourth Amendment and the style of Jennifer Granick. I'm never going to write my own blog post again. Why should I? It like did at least as good a job, you know, as I do. So yeah. I think it is really revolutionary. And it raises a lot of questions politically about like, are people sophisticated enough to understand when it's wrong? Because Chad GPT is wrong a lot. Yeah. Right. You know, are we sophisticated enough to understand if it can write, like, what's the most persuasive argument you can write that panda bears are not cool? Yeah. You know, are we sophisticated enough to understand that that's playing upon our prejudices and our cognitive bias and, and that sort of thing? So we're going to have to get more sophisticated. And anything that affects the way democracy works affects civil liberties, right? Yeah. We do a lot of work in the courts, but increasingly, our, and always our work has to do with people and people, you know, feeling like this stuff is important. So I think it's really going to be a lot. And just as a legal matter, it raises a lot of questions, it raises copyright questions, obviously, about like, you know, how the machine is trained and where the data comes from and who owns what chat GPT puts out. You know, and that sort of thing. If yeah. it writes a reasonably good Decemberist song, you know, whose song is that? But then also privacy. It's ingesting a huge amount of information about people. And, you know, what is that? You know, it's surfacing. It can surface a lot of data, data that's already being collected, obviously, by these big centralized companies that we don't easily have control over. And sometimes shouldn't have control over. You know, sometimes there are facts that are public that need to remain public. Right. These are like super complicated questions. You know, we already have super interesting issues that we deal with. Encryption, privacy, what investigators should be able to do in terms of, you know, finding criminals or national security. Like it's already a great complicated field. But when you have this technological leap, you know, it's kind of like you're stepping on the gas. Yeah. And then what do educators do now in light of this? How do you teach? Yeah. How do you teach future lawyers now when yeah. what's the future of that role going to look like? the bar. I, I mean, Chat GPT 4 was able to pass the bar, I think, with a 10%, like in the top 10%. 
And that tells you two things. I mean, one, it tells you the bar is, you know, not, <laughs> not so <laughs> high. Yes, yes. Sort of rude. And, and it is what it always has been, which is just to keep people out of the profession so we can keep our prices high, mm. which was a lesson I did not learn to keep the prices high lesson. I'm, I had lost that one somewhere along the way. But it also, you know, makes you ask yourself, what is it that makes a good lawyer? You know, because yeah. it is just a heuristic, really, of putting words together that are often seen near each other. You yeah. know, it's not like thinking about the question. So what makes a good lawyer? What, you know, and, and I think that's an opportunity to kind of revisit, you know, what the law school curriculum ought to look like. Yeah. What will the humans do in the future? You know, will there yeah. be robo lawyers and what will they be using to yeah. get the information faster? And then what still needs to be human at the end of the day? I feel like every profession would probably say the thing I'm about to say, which is that a machine cannot replace me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know who says that a machine can replace them. But I do think like having taught a clinical course for so long at Stanford Law School, I think this is just a real example where you're trying to get students to have an opportunity to do things that you can't learn by rote, like talk to a client or mm -hmm. convince a judge or put together evidence in a case or something right. like that. That mm -hmm. sort of hands-on experience is really critical. Yeah, the durable human skills to counter the emerging technology that's coming. We clearly could go on and on, but we're getting close to time here. Thanks again for joining. Maybe we could close with any concluding thoughts, any takeaways. One important thing I think for students to grow up understanding is how to organize and to make a meaningful difference over time. And it is not a skill that we're readily taught. But it is something that people always need, particularly if you're going to be there for those people who are not the elites and who don't, you know, kind of own the means of producing policy and law. Hmm. And I think New College did that for a lot of people, allowed people to study their field with an activism component to it. I think that's really an important skill to have because, you know, for everybody, there's something that's going to be important to them. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's privacy and encryption. For my neighbor, it's getting turf put in at the local dog park so it's not so muddy when it rains. Yeah. All things are really important. Figuring out how the system really works and how to, you know, pull the levers of power and get your voice heard is critical. Mm -hmm. It's really tragic that the students at New College now are having this crash course on how to protect themselves at this time. But I hope that, you know, we will all be able to rally and support them in this battle and awesome. stop this from happening to other schools if we can. Awesome. Great stuff with Jennifer Granick. You can find more about Jennifer at Granick.com. She's also a great follow on Twitter and the book is American Spies. Jennifer, thanks so much for joining me on today's show. Thank you. And for our listeners, hopefully you enjoyed what you heard. Be on the lookout for the dedicated New College feed coming soon to a podcasting app near you. This is Mike Palmer. This is Trending in Education. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.